Good morning, YouTube family, and God bless you. Today is June the 7th, 2015, and we have another message from the Lord. Um, we had worship tonight, beautiful, beautiful worship, and we were in a ballroom, and there were many other grooms dancing with their bride, but the Lord was dressed in fatigues, and a, he was wearing a maroon beret, and he had some decorations on his shirt. The whole room was filled with brides dancing with their groom, and they were all wearing fatigues and wearing maroon berets. So um, as I was watching this, I thought to myself, I'm dying to know what that maroon beret means and silly me I should have asked him but rather than asking him I just wanted to wiki it and look it up he came to me weeping he was crying and crying and crying and I got the impression as I looked at the ballroom and the other grooms and brides dancing together that this was their last night together you know the last night before they went off to war and it just was a feeling that I had you know that it was that kind of a that kind of a celebration but the Lord was weeping a great deal, and he was really hurting. I mean, really hurting. And all I could do was just hold him, even though we were dancing. And there was an exchange of love going on from his heart to my heart. It was, there was a beautiful exchange of love going on. Still, he, was, uh, he had been crying. He had been really crying for a very long time when we were in worship. And finally, after a while, he started to feel better. And you know, it's interesting. This is so beautiful. This is one of the aspects of the Bride of Christ that's so beautiful. And that is that when we began together, he was weeping and, and weeping and kind of bent over weeping. But there was consolation going on during the worship. As I was worshiping him and he was singing over me, uh, there was consolation being exchanged, and he began to stand straighter, and he began to feel stronger and stop crying. And that's what we're here for, guys. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. We are here to console the Lord. And if you're called to be a bride, you're here to console him and to be close to him and, and give him something that he longs for from all of his creatures but most of them don't know him or don't have the time of day for him because they're so busy with the world. So every one of us that shows up to comfort him makes up for thousands who don't even care to know who he really is. When we were done, um, and I felt it was time for us to talk, I went to Wiki and I, I wikied the Maroon Beret, and this is what it said. The maroon beret is a military beret and has been an international symbol of elite airborne forces since it was chosen for British airborne forces in World War II. In our country, the maroon beret belongs to a group called the Para Rescue Men. Now, this is interesting, guys. Can you get this? <laughs> The para-rescue men, all of these men uh, in the Maroon Beret are parachute trained and certified. Uh, that's part of their training. And I don't think you can be a Maroon Beret unless you have the parachute training. And that's pretty well international. And they are among the most highly trained emergency trauma specialists in the U.S. military. And the only ones in the Department of Defense specifically trained and equipped to conduct conventional and unconventional rescue processes. You know, like snatch and grab out of the hand of the enemy. Making them an ideal force to handle personnel recovery and combat search and rescue operations. And bride recovery, maybe? <laughs> uh, I mean... Can you imagine this? Here the Lord shows up in a uniform that most closely uh, describes the operations of the rapture, <laughs> snatching his bride out of harm's way. And their motto, by the way, is that others may live. Wow, I thought, oh, that is so, so appropriate to you, Lord. Amazing. Airborne rescue, yes. <laughs> 
I had to chuckle after I saw that. I thought, wow, that's so neat that he gave me those images. So I asked him, Lord, what do you want to say tonight? And he began, Oh, my precious, how grieved I am that we have come to this pass. How terrible the suffering coming upon this nation. Even the innocent who have nothing to do with the corruption, other than their littleness and lack of response to evil, because they are too little. Even these I too will take. Now that's interesting. I mean, if there's any mentally ill or people who are just so far out of the system that they... Uh, you know, they couldn't possibly be a part of the political system or, or any of the corruption of this nation. He's going to take them. That's pretty interesting. He said, I know you are growing nervous with what is being prepared as we speak, but did I not say I would deliver you out of the wrath to come? Yes, holy snatch and grab. Yes, out of harm's way. Lift it up high above the enemy to a land inaccessible. I will take you. I'm coming. This is but a glimpse of my holy mission, to remove my brides and deliver them into their eternal abodes. Oh, how recklessly you have lived, inhabitants of the earth, and how blindly you have contrived plans that were hatched from the devils. Oh, how devoured you shall be by your selfishness in that hour. And yet I will have pity on those who call out to me in that last moment of their lives. Those who see their blind selfishness in that hour, yes, call out to me in profound repentance, and I will save you. It is not my wish that you who have brought this calamity on mankind should perish in hell for eternity. I do not wish this on even the most wicked among you. I continue to extend my invitation to mercy for those who have being. In other words, those with a soul, those who have being. Because there's some out there that don't have a soul, they're just bodies. Though you have leveraged your hardness of heart on humanity, I am not like you. I'm always ready to forgive, no matter how heinous the sin. But will you? Will you extend your hand to me and cry out for help? In that moment, I will be there to receive your soul. And you, my brides, must not have a retaliatory bone in your bodies, not even one. You must reflect my compassion even on those who persecute you. You must cry out from your cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Even now, at this moment, souls detrimental to this new administration, speaking of the New World Order, are being removed from their homes. Even now, the persecution has begun. Yet I tell you the truth, not one hair on their heads shall be injured. They shall ascend to me intact. Oh, Lord, this is not a good thing. Can we please move on to something more delicate? What is more beautifully and delicately formed than souls that love me with all their heart? How much more delicate can you get, Claire? Lord, you know what I mean. The major persecution has yet to break out. There are just certain ones that have been targeted. Make no mistake about it, I'm coming. I'm coming for my bride and she will ascend. There shall be nothing hidden about her ascension. All the world will see the miracle I will perform for her. All the world will hear the trumpets. All the world will tremble. All the world will rise up in holy terror on the great and terrible day of the Lord. Nothing which I have promised will fail to come to pass. What I have said, that shall I do, and nothing less. Oh, prepare yourselves, my beloved, Prepare yourselves and pray as never before for my mercy to fall in this world. This prayer for divine mercy has found much favor from my Father in heaven. This prayer is garlanded around with graces of conversion and repentance. Pray this prayer at the memorial hour of my death, 3 p.m., wherever you may be. Do not grow lax or blind. 
rather connect with the divine movement of all of heaven as we approach that fateful hour. Oh, how I grieve for the souls that will be lost. Many of the tears, my dove, that I shed tonight were for those who have no one to pray for them. Will you pray for them? Pray for the most desperate cases and those who have no one to pray for them. Do you see? My justice is quelled by my mercy, and when you cry out for mercy, I lower my arm and withdraw my sword, and instead stretch forth a saving hand. You see, the prayer carries with it the power to bring souls to conversion, to bring them to a complete turnaround. This is the prayer of my body and shed blood. This is the prayer that recalls to my father my bitter agony to the point where his heart can no longer withhold grace from the undeserving. Why? Because he gazes upon me in my suffering and he cannot deny me that which I suffered so brutally for, the lost sinner. Call to mind the Muslim people as well, how devout many of them are, how I wish to have them for believers yet they've been crushed into submission from a tender age. They know not the meaning of mercy or life. They only know murder and hatred as being the honorable life. Tragically, these tender ones have lost all semblance of what I endowed them with and are completely overtaken by a twisted lifestyle. Poverty calls to these. The enemy has made good use of poverty and bitterness. They are taught from childhood how honorable it is to die for their God. They know nothing of the truth and have been sealed over in terror from freedom of thought. To search out another God would be treachery against their parents, their nation, and their God. And so they shut their eyes tightly, lest the light penetrate them. But in the watches of the night, and in moments when they no longer have the power to resist, I open their eyes. I flood them with my love and my truth. And these things happen because you pray. Yes, pray much and believe. Keep your eyes on the horizon, one eye on the heavens, the other on your neighbor. Neglect no act of kindness that comes before you. Yes, your salvation has been purchased at the price of my blood, but the work given you in heaven relies very much on your heartfelt loving service to others here on earth. I bless you now with the courage to love, the courage to wait in faith, the courage to stand in strength in the tumultuous hours to come. Stand until you behold my glory breaking on the horizon. And after the Lord had finished speaking to me, I felt the anointing upon uh, the book that Carol had put together, our partial messages, the most recent ones. And uh, the PDF is on our website. And I'm going to see about making it possible for you to order copies of this from the printer. We're going to work on that now because I really felt the Lord quicken uh, to me and to Ezekiel that it's time to get a bunch of these printed up and get them out to you and so that you can leave them behind for everyone. I felt the anointing on the book and, you know, sometime I'm going to do a little teaching on that about how you see a book and you realize that the Holy Spirit wants to give you a rhema of an anointed word of God from that book. And so you reach over and you pray over the book and you ask the Holy Spirit to show you something. And he does. So I I felt the anointing on this book from across the room. So I went and picked it up. And this is what I opened to. Pages 166 and 167. What is to come when the bombs fall? The Lord was speaking here. Well, because time is short, I have you both on the fast track to wrap up these messages and prepare yourselves for that day. Only in prayer and steadfastness will you weather the terrific storm that's about to hit America and the world. 
Each day I want the two of you to make sure you are solid and prepared at any moment. How will we know that we are prepared, I asked. And then I asked him, how will we know that we are prepared? He said, you're going to feel a deep peace. It's been edging up on both of you. Just continue to keep your focus and understand there's no time to waste. Please buckle down and work hard to organize your messages and leave behind what I have given you. And I have to say here, guys, he's given me an awful lot more than what's in that book. So um, I'm going to try and pull all those files up and see if we can't get something quickly put together for you in a PDF and, or some that you can order, too, from the printer or from Amazon. We'll have to see what we can do. At that point, <laughs> I was getting a little buggy. Uh, this was around, I think, 5 in the morning, and it was just a little bit buggy. And the Lord said, Claire, are you listening? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm foggy. He replied, it's the sugar. I said, whoops. He said, just bear with me. There's going to be a limited nuclear exchange, enough to throw the world into a panic and set the stage for Obama to take the reins of peace and be declared as a hero. Your country will be in pandemonium and communications will be knocked out temporarily. But in order to enforce martial law, communication will be necessary. After all, how can the victor enjoy his victory without broadcasting it all over the world? Your country will recover from this devastation more quickly than anyone would expect because everything is in place with full knowledge of what is coming. I just want to draw you guys' attention to something, and that is the, the turnkey event. I had occasion to re-listen to that today. Uh, turnkey is a term used, I guess, in business when everything is set up for a product. And, uh, you know, the marketing, the packaging, the production, everything's ready. All you have to do is say, go. That's the turnkey, and there it is. It's there, because the whole groundwork has been laid for it, and it's, it's a done deal. You just need um, the permission to go ahead with it, so to speak. So uh, one of the reasons why we're going to recover so quickly from this is because of all the groundwork that's being done right now and has been done for months, you know, and years previous to this time. As he said, your country will recover from this devastation more quickly than anyone would expect because everything is in place with full knowledge of what's coming. Your country will no longer be a world power. She will have massive issues of reconstruction and contamination to deal with. Make no mistake, those underground cities will contain the important people while everyone else struggles on the surface. Law and order will be out of control. Criminals will take full advantage to rape and pillage. Life will be a mess. That's when I'm coming for you. Lift up your heads and watch the sky. I'm coming for you that same day. Let me repeat myself. Lift up your heads. I am coming for you that very same day. Do not fall into despair. Do not panic. I've warned you over and over again. Your redemption draws nigh. This is the moment of eternity you've been waiting for. I answered him, Lord, I'm speechless. And he said, well, it's coming. As surely as I am, it is coming. Do not give in to fear. Stand your ground. Raise your eyes to the heavens. I'm coming. I've already placed my angels to help you. You will not stumble or fall. All is in place. Thank you, Lord. You see, I have wanted to confirm this to you, but I had to wait until you were secure in our communications. Jesus, I'm numb. I know. I know. It's a lot to take in, but I have prepared you well, and you will pass in flying colors. And that was the end of that message. That, by the way, was on March the 12th, 2015. And that's page 166 and 167 of uh, the book. I guess she's named it Still Small Voice, Messages from the Lord. 
And as I said, that's on our website, heartdwellers.org, under a PDF. And I think she's going to put it on the book page as well with um, Chronicles of the Bride. So the Lord bless you, family, and let's continue in being faithful to the Lord. And let's remember he's asked us to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and he's told us that there are graces being released for conversions with that and salvation with that chaplet. So let's all pray that chaplet. And he recommended that we pray it at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, which is uh, what they call the hour of mercy, the people who wrote the chaplet. The Lord bless you. Pray for us as we pray for you every day. And